Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Neil Galvin. I'm a registered nurse and I do have a degree in medical surgical nursing. I create my nursing educational videos to help nursing students and nursing professionals like you with their studies. If that is something that you are interested in, consider subscribing. If you are already a subscriber though, thank you so much for your love and support. I see you. I upload my nursing educational videos Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Please make sure to subscribe now. Hit the notification bell so that you will be the very first to watch my newest uploads. Also, don't forget to give this video a big thumbs up and share with your friends because that will really help me know that you like to see more contents like this. Without further ado, you guys, let's jump into the video. Hi, everyone. Welcome back, I guess, <laughs> to my channel. And like you see, like you're seeing on your screens, today is all about uh, nursing test banking. It's been a while since actually uh, the last time I uploaded a nursing test banking video, and this is going to be um ab all about your care of clients with physiologic and psychosocial alterations PNLE 4 to everybody who's actually watching right now and preparing for their upcoming board exam I just wish you all the best I'm doing my own little thing to help you guys with your examination and all you gotta do is to really really try to focus on your upcoming examination don't actually pressure yourself because that will not really help although I know I've been there a bit I've been there been done that um, well, the moment I actually realized that I just have to enjoy the journey of taking the board exam and just giving my all and after the exam all I gotta do is prove Ray because you know you just let the universe do its own magic wow yes and a lot of you guys are actually coming back to my channel thanking me for all the you know the help that i'm giving to all of you maraming maraming salamat po i really really appreciate all of you guys from the bottom of my heart if i haven't ha have the chance to actually uh reply to all of you um i i am actually reading all of your comments as much as possible i'm trying to connect with all of you guys but from truly from the bottom of my heart you guys you've been really really amazing team galve it is and if you haven't watched the other nursing test banking videos I created, which is probably like a thousand questions already online, specifically on my channel, read that one out, try to answer the questions, post your uh, scores on the comment section below every time you answer them. I'll be putting the actual playlist link on the description box. Whenever that one pops out, click the one out because um, there's a lot, tons, thousands of questions that you can practice. And I actually encourage you to take note of my test taking strategies, how I actually do the uh, elimination process when it comes to answering certain questions and, and the board, how are you going to attack certain questions? All right. So my, that's quite a lengthy, um, what's this, introduction. I know, I know, I know. I talk a lot. But without further ado, you guys, let's jump into the objectives of our today's discussion. All right. The, we only have two objectives. Every time we do a nursing test banking video. First one, I am going to provide and discuss to you board exam type of questions. And then I'm going to provide rationalization for each board exam type of questions. If there's anything that I want you to take note out from this discussion, this video, that is the rationalization. Because in order for you to understand and really get it, you know, even though they changed the structure of the question, they changed the, the selections and all, they changed the story of this um What's this? The question, the scenario, as long as you know the whys, the rationale, then you'll be able to answer it. All right. So that's what I'm going to give you. Next, I'll be providing to you the instructions. So let me read this to you. You will be given 10 board exam type of questions. I'll be reading the questions and the choices for you. You have five seconds to answer each question. The answer is revealed instantly after each question with rationalization. Choose the letter of the correct answer. Good luck, nurses. You take a deep breath because in a moment, we're going to start with our board exam type of question number one. When evaluating an arterial blood gas from a male client with a subdural hematoma, the nurse notes the PCO2 is 30 uh, millimeters of mercury. Which of the following responses best describes the result? Is it A, appropriate lowering carbon dioxide or CO2 reduces intracranial pressure or your ICP? B, emergent the, emergent, the client is poorly oxygenated. C, normal. Or D, significant, the client has alveolar hypoventilation. Your five seconds starts now. Ta 
time is up, you guys. That uh, is your five seconds. I hope you got this answer. I hope you got this question right. Let me change to my pen. And then the right answer for this one actually is letter A. Very good. Appropriate. Lowering carbon dioxide or CO2 reduces intracranial pressure or ICP. Here's why. A normal PCO2 value is 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. CO2 has va uh, vasodilating properties. Therefore, lowering PCO2 through hyperventilation will lower ICP caused by dilated cerebral vessels. Oxygenation is evaluated through PO2 and oxygen saturation. Alveolar hypoventilation would be reflected in an increased PCO2. All right, hence the answer is letter A. You guys, mabalik tayo. Let me just remind you that these questions are actually actual questions that uh, appeared on the previous board exam. And you know, there might be instances that they might repeat this question. So try to answer them and be familiarized with yourself. All right? All right. Board exam time for question number two. When prioritizing care, which of the following clients should be the nurse? Should the nurse, Olivia, assess first? Prioritization type of question, you guys. First, who will you assess first? That's the question. Okay, so in this type of question, you'll be given condition scenarios, and based on your prioritization, hierarchy of needs, A, B, C, D, plus Maslow's hierarchy, oh, that's how you're gonna do, and then add by. That's how you're gonna do your prioritization, all right? So A, 17-year-old clients, 24 hours post-appendectomy. B, a 33-year-old client with recent diagnosis of Guillain-Barre syndrome. C, a 50-year-old client, three days post-myocardial infarction, or D, a 50-year-old client with diverticulitis. Your five seconds starts now. Time is up, you guys. What is the answer? Very good. If the five seconds is a little bit quick for you, or too quick for you, you might actually pause the video. I don't mind. It will not hurt me, uh, and it will not hurt you, no shame. But I want you to think through it, all right? So the answer to this one is letter B. Very good. A 33-year-old client with recent diagnosis of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Guillain-Barre syndrome is characterized by ascending paralysis and potential respiratory failure. The order of client assessment should follow client priorities with this order of airways, breathing, and then circulation. What did I tell you? A, B, C. There's no information to suggest the postmyocardial infarction client has an arrhythmia or other complications. There's no evidence to suggest hem hemorrhage or perforation for the remaining clients as a priority of care. Hence, the answer is letter B. Now, speaking of Guillain-Barre syndrome, your GBS, I actually created uh, in my medical surgical playlist. Um, where actually dig dive, do a uh, almost like an MS discussion regarding not almost but technically an MS discussion about your Guia Beret. I discuss about the diagnosis, what is Guia Beret, uh, risk factors, uh, clinical um, uh, interventions, nursing responsibilities, pharmacological treatments of your Guia Beret. Check the one out, it's there all for you for free. All right, let's proceed. Question number three. JP has been diagnosed with gout and wants to know why colchicine is used in the treatment of gout. Which of the following actions of colchicines explain why it's effective for gout? So here's the question. These type of questions ask you for what? Indication of colchicine, period. Don't make it so hard for yourself, you guys. Life is simple and easy. A, replace estrogen, B, decreases infection, C, decreases inflammation, or D, decreases bone demineralization. Oh my god, that was too, like, mouthful. Demineralization. Uh. <laughs> Your five seconds starts now. There you go. That's your sign that your five, second is, five seconds is up. Who got this right? Raise your hand. Very good. Letter C decreases inflammation. Remember, you're uh, you're talking about gout. 
priority ang inflammation, you guys. Decreases inflammation is the right answer. Why? Then action of, uh, the action of colicicines is to decrease inflammation by reducing the migration of leukocytes, part of your white blood cells, to synovial fluid. Colicicine doesn't replace estrogen, decrease infection, or decrease bone demineralization. The answer is let us see. Malina Bayon, are we clear? We're good? Are you guys okay? How's your score so far? Very good. Question number four. Norma asks, for information about osteoarthritis, previously we talked about gout. This is about arth osteoarthritis, all right? Which of the following statement about osteoarthritis, which is the two types of your, um, there's actually three types of your uh, arthritis. We have osteogout arthritis, gouty arthritis, and rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid? <laughs> rheumatoid arthritis, all right? So those are the types. But for this particular question, we are asking about, the question is asking you to, or to know more or to... Uh, be for, uh, to uh, what's it? get your knowledge about your osteoarthritis. Which of the following statement about osteoarthritis is correct? Meaning, definition of term of your osteoarthritis. That's the question, period. A, osteoarthritis is rarely debilitating. B, osteoarthritis is a rare form of arthritis. C, osteoarthritis, or arthritis, I'm sorry, is the most common form of arthritis. Or D, osteoarthritis. Athletics people over 60 years old. Your five seconds starts now. Time is up, you guys. Very good. What is the answer? Everybody, letter C. Osteoarthritis is the most common form of arthritis. Yes, in terms of statistics, your osteoarthritis, your OA, the basa MS, you know, abbreviation is the most common one. Osteoarthritis is the most common form of arthritis and can be extremely debilitating. It can afflict people of any age, although most are elderly. Are we good? Very good. Let me reveal to you the question number five. We're almost halfway through our um, questions for today, all right? Halfway through our exam. So, Ruby is receiving thyroid replacement therapy, develops the flu, and forgets to take her thyroid replacement medicine. Mm, compliance to treatment. The nurse understands that skipping the, or skipping this medication will put the client at risk for developing which of the following life-threatening complications. Okay, so you have a client who forgot her medication, medication for thyroid uh, replacement therapy. What is the risk of that? What will happen? What will develop if the client, let's just say, is poor compliance to treatment? That is the question. Is it A, exophthalmus, B, thyroid storm, C, mixed edema coma, or D, tibial mixed edema? Your five seconds starts now. Whoopsie, time is up, you guys. Very good. The answer is letter C. Mm, let me change my pen here. Mix edema coma. Why? Mix edema coma severe hypothyroidism is a life-threatening condition that may develop if thyroid replacement medication isn't taken. Related to the compliance of treatment. Exophthalmus protrusion of the eyeballs is seen with hyperthyroidism. Thyroid storm is life-threatening but is caused by severe hyperthyroidism. Tibial mix edema, peripheral uh, mu uh, what's this? Mucin or mucinous edema involving the lower leg is associated with hypothyroidism but isn't life-threatening. Hence, the answer is letter C, mix edema coma. Now, we're halfway through our conversation or our examination for today. Let me just give you a quick moment to hit that subscribe button now. Thank you so much, you guys, for doing that easy, right? Subscribe and hit the notif bell because you want to be updated every time I upload a video. All right. Now we're halfway through our goal for today. Actually, I go for this year. I'm moving towards 20,000 subscribers, you guys. So, tulungan nyo na ako. Help me out. Spread the news about the channel. Keep on sharing it because the more you share, it will really help the channel to grow more and grow bigger. Para mas marami tayong, we can help a lot of nursing students and professionals. All right? Let's go. 
But I sometimes have a question number six. Nurse Sugar, ang taray naman ang name niya. Nurse Sugar is assessing a client with Cushing. Cushing syndrome. Nako. This is the picture of a patient who is having or diagnosed with Cushing syndrome. Cushing. Nalala nyo pati sa MS. This is a, a disorder of your endocrine. Sila to ng Cushing and ano ba yung kapartner ng Cushing? Cushing, Cushing, uh, diabetes insipidus. Right? Okay. Which observation should the nurse report to the physician immediately? Here's the, how are you gonna dissect and like uh, interpret this question. Your patient is diagnosed with Cushing. What is the manifestation of a patient having a Cushing syndrome that will immediately alert you? That's the question. A, a pitting edema of the legs. B, an irregular apical pulse. C, dry mucous membranes. Or D, frequent urination. Your five seconds starts now. Time is up, you guys. What is your answer? Very good. The answer is life-threatening situation ang irregular. Where's my ano? Irregular apical pulse. B is the right answer. Cushing syndrome causes aldosterone overproduction, which increases urinary potassium loss. The disorder may lead to hypokalemia. Therefore, the nurse should immediately report signs and symptoms of hypokalemia, such as an irregular apical pulse, to the physician. Edema is an expected finding because aldosterone overproduction causes so sodium and fluid retention. Dry mucous membranes and frequent urination signal dehydration, which isn't associated with Cushing syndrome. Remember, in your Cushing syndrome, all of the aldosterone are retained in the body. And aldosterone, what attracts sodium? When you have a lot of sodium, remember the biochemistry days? Wherever sodium goes, water follows. You have sodium, you have fluid retention. Gets, gets. Actually, recently, I, I have a patient in the ICU where we're trying to rule out Cushing syndrome. I am really sure. <laughs> I'm sure I, um, the way I look at him, the moment I saw him, this guy, I know that he's, he's probably like 98, 90% of my instinct is telling me that eh, he is having a Cushing syndrome. Like, is this Cushing? Uh, I talked to my doctor about it. And yeah, um, now we're still trying to rule out Cushing syndrome for him. Okay, I'll let you know. Wow. <laughs> All right, let's receive question number seven. Cyril, ha uh, Cyril with severe head trauma sustained in a car accident is admitted to the intensive care unit. 36 hours later, the client's urine output suddenly rises above 20, uh, 200 ml per hour, leading the nurse to suspect diabetes insipidus, which laboratory findings support the nurse's suspicion of diabetes insipidus. Uh, this is all about DI. Remember earlier, question number eight, we talked about Cushing. Now we talk about the opposite of Cushing, which is your diabetes insipidus. Is it A? The question is, which laboratory finding supports your DI, diabetes insipidus? I actually had a discussion regarding your DI. Cushing and DI already made a discussion about a thorough deep dive, MS type of discussion where we go through each section, including the nursing responsibilities, pharmacological treatment, medical management of your DI, the diagnosis, all of that. So read that one, watch that videos. I'll be linking it to this video too, okay? Check the description box, it's in the medical surgical playlist. So confirmatory of your DI, diabetes insipidus, is it A, above normal urine and serum osmolality levels? Is it B, below normal urine and serum osmolality levels? C, above normal urine osmolality level, below normal serum osmolality level? Or D, below normal urine osmolality level, above normal serum osmolality level? Your five seconds starts now. Remember what's the manifestation of your diabetes insipidus? Time is up, you guys. All right, the answer to this one, let me make this quick for you, letter D. Below normal urine osmolality level, above normal serum osmolality level. In diabetes insipidus, excessive polyuria causes dilute urine, resulting in a below normal urine osmolality level. At the same time, polyuria depletes the body of water. 
uh, depletes the body of water. You, yeah, yeah. Causing dehydration that leads to an above normal serum osmolality level. For the same reasons, diabetes insipidus doesn't cause above normal urine osmolality or below normal serum osmolality levels. Hence the answer is letter D. Are we good? We're good. Next, question number eight. Oh, somebody's calling me. Let me answer this one real quick. Hi! Question number eight. Sorry, that was just my lubby dubs chatting. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, question number eight. Jean Marie is diagnosed with hyperosmolar, hyperglycemic, non ketotic syndrome, what we call the HHNS. Here's the description, or here's a picture on my left side. So, um, uh, HHNS is stabilized and prepared for discharge. When preparing the client for discharge in home management, which of the following statements indicates that the client understands her condition and how to control it? We're talking about compliance to treatment once the patient is being discharged at home. Nursing education, that's the question about HHNS. All right. Is it A, I can avoid getting sick by not becoming dehydrated and by playing or by paying attention to my need to urinate, drink, or eat more than usual? B, if I experience trembling, weakness, and headache, I should drink a glass of soda that contains sugar. C, I will have to monitor my blood glucose level closely and no notify the physician if it's, if it's constantly elevated. Or D, if I begin to feel especially hungry and thirsty, I'll eat a snack high in carbohydrate. Your five second. Wait, 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 wait. Let me get my. Your five second starts right now. Time is up, you guys. What is your answer? Very good, very good. Let me give you the answer right now. Letter A is the right answer. I can avoid getting sick by not becoming dehydrated and by paying attention to my need to urinate, drink, or eat more than usual. Why is this the right answer? Listen up. Listen, huh? Ito na tayo. Inadequate fluid intake during hyperglycemic episodes often leads to HHNS. Okay, by recognizing the signs of hyperglycemia, which is polyuria, polydipsia, and Polyphagia, remember your three Ps, the signs of your hyperglycemia. Yes, the increasing fluid intake in the client may prevent HHNS. Drinking a glass of non-diet soda would be appropriate for hypoglycemia. A client with uh, the client or a client whose diabetes is controlled with oral anti-diabetic agents usually doesn't need to monitor blood glucose levels. A high carbohydrate diet would exacerbate the client's condition, particularly if fluid intake is low. Hence the answer is letter A. Are we good? Good. Nakakahinga pa ba kayo? Is you guys still breathing? Very good. Question number nine. Last two questions. Make this one count. How kiddo. A 66-year-old client has been complaining of sleeping more. Increased urination, anorexia, anorexia, weakness, irritability, depression, and bone pain that interferes with her going outdoors. Based on these assessment findings, the nurse would suspect which of the following disorders. The question is really giving you um, clinical manifestations. They're trying, this is more of like an MS type of questions when they give you um, system based clinical manifestation and you have to diagnose what type of disorder that is. All right, so let's uh, try to dissect this one. You have here increased urination, anorexia, weakness, irritability, depression, bone pain. What type of disorder this is? Is it A, diabetes mellitus? Is it B, diabetes insipidus? C, hypothyroidism? Oh, I'm sorry, hypoparathyroidism or D, hyperparathyroidism. Your five seconds starts now. Time is up, you guys. Very good. What is the answer? The answer is letter D, hyperparathyroidism. Very good. Here's the picture. Oh, okay, dyan para kayong ano dyan. All right. Hyperparathyroidism is most common in older women or older women and is characterized by bone pain and weakness from excess parathyroid hormone, what we call your PTH. Clients also exhibit hyperkaliuria, causing polyuria. 
While clients with diabetes mellitus and diabetes insipidus also have polyuria, they don't have a bone pain and increased sleeping. Hypoparathyroidism is characterized by urinary frequency rather than polyuria. Are we good? We're good. Last question for today's examination. Make this one count. Board exam time of question number 10. All right, Nurse Lourdes is teaching a client recovering from Addisonian crisis. If you don't know what's Addison's disease, you guys, here's the picture. All right, this is the clinical manifestation. I'm actually giving you adrenal crisis or your Addisonian crisis. Read, that's for you, okay? About the need to take fluid cortisone, acetate, and hydrocortisone at home. Which statement by the client indicates an understanding of the instruction? Again, compliance to treatment. Home health, uh, home health, home education when you're going to discharge at home. Okay. All right. Compliance to treatment. Ito. Okay. Let's, let me give you the choices. I'll take my hydrocortisone in the late afternoon before dinner. B, I'll take all of my hydrocortisone in the morning right after I wake up. C, I'll take two thirds of those when I wake up and one third in the late afternoon. D, I'll take the entire dose at or at bedtime. And five seconds starts right now. Time is up, you guys. What is your answer? Very good. The answer is letter C. Letter C. <laughs> Okay, letter C is the right answer. I'll take two-thirds of those when I wake up and one-third on the late afternoon. Here's why. Hydrocortisone, a glucocorticoid, should be administered according to the schedule that closely reflects the body's own secretion of its hormone. Therefore, two-thirds of those of hydrocortisone should be taken in the morning and one-third in the late afternoon. This dosage or dosage schedule reduces adverse effects. There you have it. Thank you so much, you guys. Please like, share, and subscribe to my channel for more nursing educational videos. Let me know your scores on the description box below. And please give this video a like. I know you will. So do it and share this to the upcoming test takers, board exam test takers that we have in the Philippines. Or if you're reviewing for your NCLEX, this is also one of good resources for you. Help me out. Tulungan nyo na nga ako. Ipamalitan nyo na sa radyong sira ang pinakabago, pinaka-fresh at pinakalibring Nursing Review Center sa balat ng YouTube. And I'll see you again on Friday for another upload. You have a good one.